Attention! Observe precautions for handling electrostatic sensitive devices. <laughs> yup. Yup. We're just gonna rip this thing open and go at it. No wrist straps for me. Uh, that's for stuff's for sissies. Ah, uh, yeah. Handle it all up. Uh, feels so good. Yeah, the uh, real risk of dam damaging these things with ESD is non zero, but pretty much. Now, if you're in a production environment, that may be a different story. But uh, basically, if you're not zapping every doorknob you touch, you'll be fine. After all, these are ESD protected devices. All right, the repair work should be done, I hope. And now it's time to test it. Now, I could just hook this thing directly up to a battery, but if there's a problem, I could run into major issues once again. So, I want to do something different. Uh, something that's a little bit safer. Now, before I connected it up to batteries through a current limiting device, that works just fine. You can use a fuse or a 1 ohm resistor or something of that nature. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use my power supply. I got this new toy, uh, very cheap, probably Chinese or something brand. I don't really know to tell you the truth, but it's a 5 amp the variable power supply, which uh, I'm going to use. This costs less than $100. I have lots of projects I can use it for, so it was a good investment for me. So I'm going to hook that up to the input. It goes up to 5 amps, current limited, so I can turn it on, see what the output voltage is, set it up and down, and set the current up and down. Um, and I can uh, make it so that it goes up to 5 amps or down to whatever. It'll current limit it, which is great. And then on the output, I have my multimeter just connected up reading volts AC. So. Let's uh, hook this thing up. Negative and positive. Let me quick check the switch. Switch is on. Let me turn that off. All right. Now that it's off, let's see what happens. Okay, I have hooked up at 13 volts and zero current with the switch off. So that's good. That means that I don't have any sort of horrible short in here. And let me check my current limit. I'll just leave my volts at 13.1. That's fine. I'll set my current limit to 1 amp. And I will turn the switch on and see what happens. Went all the way up to 1 amp. That's not a good sign. It maxed out my power supply at its 1 amp setting, which isn't a good sign, but it is also possible that the inverter requires more than 1 amp, at least intermittently, to function properly. So I'm going to crank up my current limit to 2 amps and give it a try again. And there you go. It takes more than 1 amp to run. It takes 1.2 amps at idle. And it outputs 122 volts AC. Take a look at the waveform just for fun. There's the waveform. Nice clean sine wave like it's supposed to be out of this inverter. And I'm just going to let it run briefly because it's taking uh, 15 watts or so. That 15 watts is going into heat somewhere and I don't have anything heat sink, so I don't want to leave it on very long. Obviously there's dangerous voltages in here, so be careful. But I'll shut it off now and just take a look at uh, temperatures. As long as I touch just one thing at a time, I'll be safe. Just checking for anything that's unusually hot. So far nothing's even the least bit warm. And diodes. These have high voltage on them, so be really careful here. But uh, nothing seems to be getting warm. That means that the majority of my losses are in these transformers. Inductors, chokes, etc. So, the inverter does seem to work again. Let's see if I can actually power something now. For load, I'm just going to use my light bar that I usually use for this. But this is just a 5 amp power supply, so I can't power much. I have a 15 watt bulb in here. Yes, 1.5. So let's turn this thing on. Let's see if it powers this light bulb. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I have to screw the light bulb in before it works. Yeah, makes sense. So there we go. Powering a 15 watt light bulb. Now I'm just going to take my infrared thermometer and monitor the temperature of these components. I have this on uh, Fahrenheit at the moment, apparently. 
I prefer Celsius for this work, but monitor the temperature of these various different devices on here and see if anything gets warmer than anything else to see if this is working properly or not. Then after it runs for a while, I'll uh, reassemble it. So the basic functionality has been checked. It does operate, it outputs a clean sine wave, and it can power a very light load. Now, I can reassemble this whole thing back into the case with all the heat sinks and all the screws that I have over there in that Tupperware container, and uh, put this all back together. But when I'm done, I hope I will have a functional 1500 watt inverter once again. All right, it's time for the part of the video that everybody seems to like, the failure. Well, hopefully not, but possibly. I have this inverter fully assembled again and repaired for the second time. And I'm going to test out a little bit further. Sure, it ran a 15 watt light bulb, but well, that's not a whole lot. So let's try something more. This time I have it hooked up to a 45 amp power supply. And I also have a current meter on it so we can see how much current it's drawing. I'm just going to use these light bulbs again as a load. But uh, I will run it on this power supply, turn it on. Did not blow up, so that's a good start. 125 volts output. Plug in my lights. <clears throat> Here's my 15 watt light bulb. Apparently draws 14 watts. And my inverter is drawing 2.3 amps. Turn on some load here. Make sure that the uh, current doesn't do anything crazy. That's one 100 watt light bulb. Turn on another one. Okay, that one's burned out. Try this one. There's a second one. That one works. Third one. Fourth one. <clears throat> so we have 340 watts of load at 106 volts because this inverter does that as I covered way earlier when I was trying to review it before this turned into a repair video. So we'll try one more light bulb. That was uh, too much, not for the inverter, but for my power supply. Would have shut down eventually. So I'm going to leave it this way. We have, and now it's uh, hit the next internal uh, pseudo tap. Now it's running at 127 volts. In any case, 127 volts, 450 watts, drawing 39 amps. Not bad at all. So there are some light bulbs running here, four 100 watt bulbs. And I'm just going to let this run for a while. I'm going to monitor the uh, case temperature of this inverter and see if anything crazy happens. I would at least get a start there. Um, let it run for 20 minutes or so just to make sure that everything is stable before I hook it up to a battery and do a real stress test. While this mini stress test is going on, just a kind of a sanity check, make sure you're making sure that things are balanced, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about why I think this inverter failed the second time. Now, I had stress tested this before with a full load. Well, 1500 watts can't really do it, but a full load as far as this inverter could actually do out of the factory, and it survived just fine. I also tested high surge loads, and it survived just fine. So, why did it fail when I was trying to demonstrate it here? Well, my uh, thought on that is that there is one thing I didn't stress this inverter for. I didn't heat it up all of the way and then do a high surge test. And what actually happens inside these inverters in the boost stage, because it is a push-pull configuration on that transformer, it grounds one tap and it grounds the other tap alternately, transformers can saturate if there's any DC bias to that. And ferrite cores, what those transformers are made of that store that magnetic field, have a permeability that changes depending on its temperature. So they saturate much quicker when they're hot than when they're cold. In general, there's different materials and if you're actually designing a product then you have to be careful with that sort of thing. But I suspect that those transformers got very hot because you can see that the Teflon tape and such kind of melted around the windings on here uh, in the earlier segments of the video. I suspect that they got very hot under continuous load and then when I tried to pull a very high load they saturated. Now, that isn't necessarily damaging to the transformer, but what happens when the transformer saturates? 
is that the FETs no longer have a controlled current going through them. And you see very, very high current spikes on those transistors, like the one that just blew up. And, uh, well, that causes localized heating in the FETs, and uh, localized heating can cause failure, just like we saw. So that's my suspicion. I think it's uh, just a, a design issue here. Uh, and it doesn't help that those are 40 volt FETs. It's, it's very marginal that way. Other than 40 volts, they're very good quality. But in any case, everything here seems stable so far. I'm going to let it run for a while more, make sure it survives, and uh, then we'll move on. A few minutes later, and it's still running just fine. Nothing's really even noticeably warm to the touch. Air coming out's cold, so it seems to be working just fine. Standing here bored, I wanted something to do, so I measured the efficiency of it, operating just as it is with a 450 watt resistive load, and it's about 87%, which is perfectly reasonable. So, it does seem to be operating. Probably can't read this display very well on camera, but it says 13 volts input. Well, it did, anyway. 12.65 now. Not sure what's going on there. Anyway, we have 13.15 on the multimeter. So this isn't perfectly adequate. There's some losses inside the inverter, apparently. And let's check the load. I know I already reviewed this, but we'll check it anyway. 320 watts, it says. It's actually 450. Not very accurate. Kind of useless, really. But at least the voltage display kind of works. Time for a final test here. I'm not going to go over all the different things that I'd like to do to test it, but I at least want to do a high load for a period of time to make sure that it's Repaired, I've got my two batteries here fully charged, connected up to the inverter with two gauge wire. I can turn it on, and uh, hopefully I don't need this quick disconnect again. But it does run, and I'm going to power this electric heater. 1500 watts, it's got three settings. Try low. 500 watts. At 115 volts, medium. 700 watts, 108 volts, high, no popping yet, 1000 watts, 99 volts. So as before, this heater can't really do 1500 watts as is advertised, but I can at least let it run at a heavy load. And here you can see that the power meter is pretty close to accurate. 930 watts there versus actually 1,000. Oh, that's volts. Versus actually 990. In any case, I can let it run for a while here and make sure that the inverter doesn't uh, smoke once again. Hopefully not. In which case, I will call it fixed because I've already tested it and uh, this was just another repair. So while this is running, would I recommend this inverter? It's been so long, I actually don't remember if I already did this segment. But, uh, no, accurate tools. It is not accurate, and it is not quality. I certainly would not recommend this inverter. Now, it's not horrible. It does output a reasonably good sine wave, and some other things about it aren't particularly horrible. It certainly doesn't cost a whole lot. But, uh, it really isn't what it's advertised to be. So. I don't like things with extremely poor build quality, like this one has. Inside, it's got all sorts of issues with it. And it is actually getting warm now. But anyway, this is one that I'd probably stay away from. I'll let this run for a while longer. I assume it'll work fine, but uh, in any case, unless something happens, I'm just going to end the video here. So, thank you for watching.